Welcome back for our eighth installment of our church history class. Today we're going to be talking about the Reformation, humanism, and the Counter-Reformation. Again, way too much material for about 30 to 40 minutes, but we'll do what we can. Thanks again for joining us. Happy almost Thanksgiving to you guys out there. So today we're going to be talking about the end of the Middle Ages, the beginnings of humanism, how it feeds into the Renaissance. Now humanism comes in two different parts. There's humanism south of the Alps in Italy, and there's a humanism that's north of the Alps and the rest of Europe, uh, which becomes more formative, of course, for the Reformation. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to be talking about a little bit about Martin Luther, his life, his times, his influence, the Reformation in general terms, some other figures from the Reformation like John Calvin or Ulrich Zwingli. And then we'll mention the Counter-Reformation, especially our favorite folks out there, the Jesuits. So without further ado... Here we are, Renaissance humanism. That's Cicero, by the way. He's not Renaissance humanism. He's just classic Roman. So what is Renaissance humanism? A couple of scholars have written this. A philosophy of education that favored classical studies in the school curriculum. As opposed to what? Well, north of the Alps, scholasticism holds sway. And especially this Aristotelian metaphysics that went along with it, speaking in very general terms, right? Again, another scholar says... An intellectual movement, primarily literary and philological, which was rooted in the love and desire for the rebirth of classical antiquity. Aha! You see, the humanists south of the Alps considered life back in ancient Greece and Rome to be far better than the Dark Ages and then, of course, the, the following Middle Ages. Uh, they wanted a return of the art of the ancients, the literature and the letters of the ancients, the rhetoric and the eloquence of the ancients etc. Now, we have to understand that this movement wanted to put an emphasis on the liberal arts when it came to education, of grammar, rhetoric, poetry, history, and moral philosophy, and all of these are necessary to perfect man. And there is a, a special emphasis on rhetoric, on rhetoric. Why is this different from the scholasticism that came before? For this reason, scholasticism that came before focused more on the results of scholarly inquiry, right? Getting the right answers. Uh, a focus on rhetoric focus is more about how you deliver the information. Uh, you know, we're so, I don't know, modern people just think in terms of information, information transfer, you know, plugging in your USB cable and getting the pictures from one device to another. The ancients, and especially the Renaissance humanists, cared far more, or far much more, about how they were able to deliver beautiful words in a way that would affect and sway men's minds and hearts and their souls, right? Uh, and this is something from Cicero that was picked up on by the, the Renaissance humanists, for eloquence is nothing else than wisdom speaking copiously. <laughs> All right, so by the way, all of this came about through uh, a process of rediscovery of ancient sources, especially ancient sources uh, like Plato and Sophocles in their original Greek. Um, even though Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire was beset and finally overthrown by the Muslims, uh, there were many scholars that fled from the east to the west and they brought with them their literary cultural heritage. And this was, of course, bad for the East, bad for the Byzantine Empire and their fall in 1453, but it ended up being very good for the West. This is from uh, the scholar Spitz. Uh, do I have his book around here somewhere? I have it stacked away. Uh, so this scholar, uh, uh, Spitz, he wrote a two-volume set that you can get through CPH called The Renaissance and Reformation Movements, and they are excellent resources if you want a general overview of the time and the persons of the Re Renaissance and Reformation. I can't highly recommend it enough. Anyways, he writes, The humanists recognized each other as brothers joined in the battle against medieval barbarism and builders of a new world of thought. Their zeal for the recovery and study of the classics made them not only intellectual elitists, but virtually devotees of a cult. So there's few of them, uh, but they recognize one another, and they strive for excellence, uh, and they actually become very influential for the arts and government and these sorts of things. 
Now, not only were they rediscovering the ancient Greek sources uh, and the philosophy and the Platonism of, of the Greeks that had come before them, they were also rediscovering and, and, uh, and coming to a greater appreciation of the patristics, uh, the fathers, the church fathers. Uh, there is one humanist that I think deserves our attention. His name is Marsilio Ficino. He championed a Neoplatonist synthesis with Christian theology that exalted the freedom and capacity of the human soul to ascend toward God through seeking and discovering truth wherever it is found. Now, this is, to put that in clearer terms, uh, in the Middle Ages, according to church teaching, there was a very pessimistic view of man post-fall, right? Uh, we are burdened by weakness and sin. What Ficino discovered in Plato and other uh, Platonists was a great inner and natural dignity to the soul that was free from the burden of sin, which pertained more towards the externals of the body. And so the soul, if it was able to perceive the light of truth and move towards that truth, uh, that was for him the, the spiritual and natural ascent to God. And this could happen both through philosophy through eloquence and rhetoric, right, and the disciplines of, of the humanists of that day as they strove towards uh, uh, mastery of, of uh, uh, delivering the content beautifully, uh, but also, you know, through the scriptures. And what he ended up thinking was that uh, the human soul was, in, some, in somewhat uh, Pelagian terms, right, uh, so unencumbered by sin uh, and could so ascend to, to the divine and uh, the transcendent truths through philosophy and reason and spiritual ascent that even the pagan philosophers like Plato uh, could have been uh, able to enter into the com communion with God apart from the special revelation of the Gospels in Christ. Uh, because they, from his point of view, they were all aiming towards the same end. Under, So that's just an example of one uh, Renaissance humanist and and his high view of man and high view of the spirit of man, right? And you also get this idea of the outer, earthly, corrupted, and then the inner, uh, the inner spiritual enlightened distinction that was at play there. So under influences like these, a man like Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci excelled in exploring and depicting the harmonies of the natural world. Uh, the fine arts flourished under the tutelage of the humanists, indeed. Uh, an example of, of Renaissance art that is influenced by the rediscovery of Greek sources and, and uh, Greek philosophy unencumbered by scholasticism of the Middle Ages. This is Raphael's The School of Athens. You can see at the center of the image two philosophers. The old guy with, who's bald, that's Plato. He's pointing up into the heavens saying, yes, you need to contemplate the eternal forms through introspection and meditation on the concepts as such. And there you have next to him on the right, our good friend Aristotle, who is emphasizing, no, not a drawing inward through the rationalistic philosophy that you're teaching Plato, but rather an observation of the data of experience. That's what we need. And through this observation of the many particulars of existence, the, uh, the various forms of things can be abstracted and known. So man is not born with an innate knowledge of eternal things that he must return to, right? Rather, man is born as a, a blank slate and filled up with the data of experience, and, and uh, the intellect sorts through all of that to come to a true apprehension and knowledge of things. So this is what uh, the, uh, the Renaissance artists were starting to think about under the tutelage of the humanists uh, through their rediscovery of ancient Greek and classical sources. And, of course, this had not only effects when it came to sacred art, but, or, or, I'm sorry, with secular art, but also with sacred art as well. This is Michelangelo's The Last Judgment, and see the detail uh, uh, and the focus on humanity <laughs> and the bodies and, and uh, the beauty of man uh, through his art, you know. That's Jesus at the center of the frame. Uh, and every single aspect of this gigantic fresco that, that covered the back of a chapel is absolutely amazing and wonderful. Now, when it comes to Northern humanism, this was less uh, about a platonic rebellion against the old Aristotelian scholasticism. 
Uh, uh, instead, this was focused around three ideals according to Alistair McGrath, good letters written and spoken eloquence. It was also a religious program directed towards the revival of the Christian church, and it fostered a pan-European identity and a pacifist attitude. Uh, so the Northern uh, humanists wanted absolutely to return to the sources. This included classical and biblical sources. They wanted the original Greek of the New Testament, the original Hebrew, to master those particular ancient languages to come to a more accurate understanding of the text in its original form, as opposed to having it mediated through, let's say, the Latin Vulgate. They also wanted a moral reformation among the Christians, especially the clergy, reflecting the true nature of the Gospels, uh, which taught not uh, the cold, tired, um, uh, emotionless piety of, let's say, a, a priest saying mass in a side chapel to set a, a soul free from the fire of purgatory. Rather, what they wanted was a living Christianity of active virtue. They also satirized and criticized the social and the churchly abuses of their time that had become prevalent at the end of the Middle Ages. And they also focused, and this is true of both the Northern and the Southern humanists, they focused on the subjective individual rather than thinking of man as corporate, as a group. An example of a good, uh, a wonderful Northern humanist would be Thomas More. He was born in 1478 in London. He studied Greek and law, I believe at Oxford. And in his early 20s, he had a spiritual crisis that drove him towards Carthusian style monasticism, where, you know, you would wear hair shirts and beat yourself because of your many sins. Uh, and thankfully, he escaped from that extreme monasticism uh, 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 in time, he escaped, he, he, his melancholy was broken and, and he entered into governmental service and he criticized Henry VII openly and because of that he was noticed by Henry VIII and uh, asked to join his court. Uh, he befriended Erasmus, the great northern humanist and the prince of humanists as he's sometimes called and in 1499 he hosted him during his stay in England. He authored the work Utopia, which criticized the abuses of his times and described an idyllic society founded on ethical and reasonable principles. Now, just because you're a humanist and you recognize churchly abuse and you want to address churchly abuse, especially when it comes to ethical reformation, that doesn't necessarily mean that they went along with the reformation program, which was against the Pope as the center and the heart of the Christian church. So, because he opposed Henry VIII's ecclesial superiority, he was put to death in 1535, July the 7th. Erasmus of Rotterdam, the prince of the humanists, he was born in the Netherlands in 1469, uh, but he studied, taught, and published throughout Europe. Uh, he was schooled under the Brethren of the Common Life at Deventer from seven, 1475 to 1483. Uh, he entered an Augustinian community and was ordained as a priest, but his sacred uh, interest soon gave way to secular interest, especially after traveling to Paris and observing the cold, stale, lifeless scholasticism of the universities there. In 1499 in England, Colette urged Erasmus to study Greek as the key to understanding the New Testament, Erasmus did, and within a few years, he published a critical edition of the Greek New Testament. What is the critical, edi a critical edition of the Greek New Testament? Basically, uh, you compare various manuscripts of the Greek, or the original Greek, and you note where they differ, and you make choices as to what is probably the most authentic or original reading. And like Coming in, and so you have to come up with a philosophy or a method for choosing maybe a, a one reading over another. Now, this gives you maybe the impression that the New Testament Greek is, in fact, Swiss cheese full of holes and inconsistent. That's not necessarily true. Uh, that with all of the changes that are there in the New Testament Greek or variations between manuscripts, there's nothing there that affects the, the teaching. There's nothing there that affects the main point. Uh, they're usually uh, just differences of word order. Uh, differences of expression, uh, like sometimes you uh, would have a scribe copying and he was so used to maybe two words going next to each other that don't necessarily uh, appear in the original that he would just insert the, the other word that he was so used to hearing 
Like you hear Father, 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 and of course you hear what precedes it in a Christian church, Our Father, Our Father, Our, our Father. So as an example, like a, a, a scribe would put Our before Father and then just keep on going thoughtlessly. And it just ends up like that in the manuscript. doesn't affect the meaning or anything. Uh, but Erasmus cared about what the original said, and so that's why he did the comparison of texts, made choices about what should go where, and we ended up with a critical edition of the Greek New Testament. And critical editions of the Greek New Testament are what theologians use to this very day. Uh, not necessarily Erasmus's. Uh, they have the Nestle Island, the UBS, and the SBL. They're all out there. You can learn more about that if you want, uh, if you want to get into textual criticism. Just remember that it got a start from the humanists, uh, these men who were intensely interested in the original source material of the New Testament. Uh, he also wrote uh, The Praise of Folly. He produced, again, right, a critical edition of the Greek New Testament, and he attacked the Reformation. It, this is interesting to note. So even though uh, Luther seemed at the very beginning, in the late 15 teens, to be championing the humanist cause and speaking about church abuses, uh, nevertheless, he attacked the Reformation and Luther when Luther ended up speaking pessimistically concerning the state of fallen man especially with regard to the fact that man cannot have free will towards God, to choose God, to chase after God, to make God his own. Uh, that Luther said it is various teachings, teachings and indicated that man is spiritually dead until he is brought to life by the Holy Spirit through the gospel. Erasmus, like a good humanist that sees this sort of an inner dignity and light in man, rebelled against that, wrote against that in his diatribe, and Luther, of course, responded, and it is one of his most famous works, On the Bondage of the Will. And if you haven't read On the Bondage of the Will, uh, go on Amazon or to your local favorite bookstore, find it, buy it, read it. You'll be blessed. Erasmus died in 1536 in Basel, and even though he disagreed with Luther on many things, he was still uh, said to have been uh, sympathetic to, to many of the aims and goals of the Reformation. Uh, but he didn't break from the church as the rest of the reformers would, right? Uh, he desired his work, and his, especially his biblical uh, theology, to enlighten the world with the philosophy of Christ, which was a simple, moralistic, anti-dogmatic interpretation of the New Testament, that Jesus showed us a better way to live among one another, so we should imitate that and become that. Uh, again, very different from uh, the moral or, or, or the, the, the preaching of the gospel as you might find from Martin Luther. So let's talk about Luther. He was born in 1483 in Eisleben in Germany. He became an Augustinian friar after a life-changing storm on the 30th of June, 1505, uh, caused him uh, to pray to St. Anne, the patron saint of mines and miners, saying, St. Anne, uh, save me, and I will become a monk, right? And, uh, you know, he, he lived through the storm, and he kept his word to this saint that he prayed to and entered uh, and entered a monastery to become an Augustinian friar. He, in where he was studying, uh, uh, was in Erfurt, and he tried, and he picked out the most difficult of all the monastic communities there to join and to be a part of. Uh, he became quickly a a, 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 a priest, a doctor of the Holy Scriptures, and he taught theology and biblical studies at Wittenberg, a new university there in Germany. Uh, he applied, this is where humanism fits in with the Reformation, the philological tools of humanism, right? The very close attention to grammar, uh, to syntax, to rhetoric, and he applied these, these, these particular tools of humanism, mastery of the ancient languages of Greek and Hebrew, to his biblical studies and to his biblical lectures in the years leading up to and even after, of course, the Reformation. Now, he did struggle with the Via Moderna style of theology, uh, that God will bless what is best in you as you draw it close to him. Uh, that's Gabriel Beale style theology um, that that recognizes an inner capacity within man. You might call it semi-Pelagian. I certainly would. Uh, but what Luther came, struggled with, especially, was that God is, in some ways, doubly capricious and vengeful against man. 
Not only has God given man the law, he's also given man an even more difficult law to keep through Christ. Uh, you have heard it, say, it said to, to those of old, you shall not murder. But I say to you, whoever even calls his brother a fool is liable to the judgment of hell. Or, I'm sorry, the hell of fire. Uh, and so Luther, again, he, he struggled with that. And then also he struggled with the fact that he was born with this sinful and fallen condition. And no matter how much he stro strove to keep the law outwardly and inwardly, he never could. And so he began to, in fact, hate God. This God, this vengeful, uh, uh, judging God of medieval theology. And this is Luther in his own words. Until he came to understand the meaning of the righteousness of God as we read about it in, let's say, Romans chapter 1. Uh, he thought that this was the righteousness of God in and of himself and that righteousness that he expected man to attain by their striving after his ordinances and works. What he soon discovered by careful study of the biblical text, that is that the righteousness of God is a gift. It is given by God's grace, and it is received not because of our digni inner dignity and works, but because of faith alone. Now, all of that comes in time in the course of the Reformation, uh, but at the beginning, uh, Luther understood that there was something wrong with the, the, the Roman church's teaching concerning repentance. And so this comes out in John Tetzel's indulgence tour, and he comes through town, and he teaches the people, hey, with a little bit of money inside this box, you can set your soul and other souls free from the burning fires of purgatory. So Luther's like, well, we need to talk about indulgences because I've actually been studying the scriptures, and I can't exactly find a lot there. So let's come up with 95 points of disputation, and I'm going to nail them to the church, uh, castle, uh, to the castle church door there in Wittenberg. And of course, people saw this. Uh, they saw that Luther was attacking a kind of a cash cow of the Pope and attacking one of the most foundational uh, uh, doctrines that the, the Pope's church was using at that time, both to enrich itself and to enforce uh, uh, compliancy throughout the church, throughout the world. And it became uh, a spark that lit a fire. Soon Luther found himself in conversation with, in argumentation with other theologians in that area. Uh, and he asked to be instructed concerning this from the scriptures, uh, to, be, to have others prove their case to him. Uh, Luther started to develop his own biblical theology. In 1519, he gave his uh, very famous Heidelberg Disputation. In 1519, uh, very famously, he had a debate with John Eck at Leipzig, where Eck called Luther out and says, and he's told him, it sounds like uh, the only authority you'll acknowledge in this debate is the scripture. No councils, uh, no popes, no church fathers, just the scripture. And Luther says to Eck, you know what? You're right. God be praised. The sola scriptura principle, which really uh, is the heart, the beating heart of the Reformation took off after that. Uh, it is that we don't need a council to govern the church on earth. We don't need a pope to govern the church on earth. All we need is Christ, and Christ is sufficiently here and for us through his preached word. Uh, of course, when uh, uh, he was asked <laughs> uh, to, when he was asked to, to recant of his writings and his teachings against the false teachings of the Roman church at that time, at the 1520 Diet of Worms, Luther gave his very famous words, uh, Here I stand, I could do no others. God help me. Amen. Uh, he was, of course, uh, target number one on uh, the, the Pope's bad people list. <laughs> uh, remember, that wasn't more like a hundred years before that John Huss was captured for saying and teaching many of the same things and put to death at the Council of Constance. And so Luther's friends, uh, uh, some of the, the princes of, of Germany kidnapped him and made him hide out at the Wartburg for a time. And Luther used this time to continue his project of reformation, especially with regard to the translation of the Holy Scriptures from the original language, not through a middle language, right? That would confuse things. And No, he st went straight from the original languages of Greek and Hebrew so that uh, the people of Germany could read the Scriptures, you know, for them. Uh, uh, as, as a direct translation into their vernacular in their tongues so that they could hear 
the word of Christ and that Christ could govern over the church there in Germany, not through the mediation of, of popes or anything like that, but straight from the word. Uh, during uh, 1527, he married Catherine von Bora, who uh, was an escaped nun. He had children. Uh, he continued his work of the Reformation there in, in Wittenberg. He never wandered too far away from Wittenberg because, uh, you know, again, if he wandered into lands that were more favorable towards the, uh, the Pope and his church, uh, he certainly would have been captured, perhaps even killed. So he stayed pretty close to home. And after lecturing and teaching and doing many fine works of theology, uh, to mention a couple of a few of the works that you should seek out of Martin Luther and read. Of course, I mentioned Bondage of the Will, his large catechism, uh, in, and his small catechism. But the large catechism, if you're theologically interested, is definitely a place to go. His Confession Concerning Christ's Supper of 1528 is excellent. Uh, I would also recommend his Greater Galatians Commentary of 1535. And then finally, uh, his lectures and commentary on Genesis from the late from the mid 1540s before he died, his swan song before he died. All of these will impress upon you the fact that Luther believed the word. Like we read the Bible in an as if tentative sort of way, like, well, this is what it says. And I suppose that it could be true. No, Luther read the Holy Scriptures and, and, and the way he spoke about it gave you the absolute conviction that this is a man who really believes the word of God. And for that reason, he continues to be a fine and excellent teacher and proclaimer of Christ even till today. Let's talk about the Reformation in more general terms, just outside of the person Luther. Uh, in 1517, it, uh, October the 31st, it's said that he nailed the 95 Theses, and that is traditionally seen as the beginning of the, of the Reformation. We mentioned the Heidelberg Disputation of 1518, where he criticized, this is important to know, both the old scholasticism and the new humanism uh, as, as, man, uh, as human wisdom uh, that cannot compare to the, the greater divine wisdom of the of the word of god right in leipzig debate of 1519 where he clarified that the only authority that he recognized as definitive in this debate concerning indulgences and repentance and faith is the scripture the word of god the diet of worms right he had escaped from that he spent time at the Wartburg from 1521 to 1522 and then you have the enacting of the reformation in wittenberg from the early part of the 1520s to about 1530 uh, in the middle part of the 1520s, also, we had the Peasants' Revolt, where uh, uh, some of the, the common people were incited by the members of the Radical Reformation uh, to disengage themselves from worldly government and worldly tyranny, uh, to make for themselves an apocalyptic community, uh, for waiting for the imminent return of Christ, and they, and they fought against their, uh, the lords of the land, and Luther, instead of siding with the, the peasants, said this is lawlessness and rebellion. And he told the, the lords of the land, it is necessary for you to put down the revolt. That makes Luther a bad guy in the judgment of history nowadays, where uh, Marxist revolution revolt is very popular. But I would also say you have to understand Luther's position. He is not advocating for uh, worldly revolution for worldly liberty. Instead, he is preaching the freedom of conscience according to the gospel. And he is certainly right that we should show respect, honor, and, and give obedience to worldly authorities over us, as Luther himself teaches in the fourth commandment. Uh, more about that if you listen to our preaching and teaching here at this church. So uh, after the Peasants' Revolt, of course, you have the Malburg Colloquy, which is a uh, the attempt to bring together the Lutherans and the Zwinglians, uh, because the thing that was driving them apart and keeping them apart was uh, Zwingli's inability to rationally uh, come to grips with the real presence of Christ in the Holy Supper. Uh, for Zwingli, this was a symbolic presence. For Luther, Jesus' words, this is my body, this is my, bless, my blood, must be believed. Uh, so Zwingli and Luther separated after that and understood they could not be reconciled. In 1530, at the Diet of Augsburg, before the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, the Lutheran princes presented their Augsburg Confession. So this was not the theologian standing before the emperor saying, we're, we're saying this, we're thinking this. 
No, these were the leaders and the princes, the electors of his own realm standing before him and saying, this is what we ourselves and our people that we govern believe, teach, and confess. We hold to this. This isn't just a, a theologian thing. This is a church in our land thing. This is what we hold to because we've been convinced by the scriptures. Our conscience cannot be moved off of this, right? Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, the very real threat of war against these, these princes who refused to budge spiritually became, uh, uh, became so visceral and real that the small Caldic League was uh, uh, put together among uh, Lutheran princes and their lands to form a league of defense against the Holy Roman Emperor uh, who had plans to engage them in battle to reinstate the old piety of the Roman Church. Uh, historically speaking, just to put really make a very long story very, very short, the Lutherans are very bad at fighting worldly battles. Uh, they got their butts kicked by the Pope's forces uh, in, in conjunction with uh, Charles V, of course, and, and on paper, Roman Catholicism was reinstated just about everywhere, but in actuality, you can't root out the preaching of the Reformation once it's taken hold uh, in people's hearts and minds, once it's taken hold of their souls, and once you have pastors installed at various congregations preaching uh, the word alone, grace alone, and faith alone. And for that reason, various interims will, will come up with a kind of compromises between the, the Lutherans and the Romans. Uh, and some of the Lutheran theologians and churches went around, along with the interims. Others didn't, and they were known as the Genesio Lutherans. This caused a lot of strife and, and argumentation and dissension among the Lutherans until, through the efforts and the hard work of second-generation reformers like uh, Martin Chemnitz, the second great Martin, right? Uh, uh, David Critias and other theologians like them, uh, they uh, articulated the formula of Concord of 1580, which then spoke definitively and biblically concerning many of the great deba debates of that time. Uh, and so I also commend that to you. Uh, for those of you who are Lutheran or are interested in the Lutherans who continue to uh, believe, teach, and confess the things that are taught by the 1580 Book of Concord. It's free and available online. Just Google it, and you'll see it, and read away. It's necessary to talk about the Radical Reformation. These are the folks that thought that Luther and his conservative Reformation didn't go far enough. So Luther uh, wanted to not abolish the divine service as it was, uh, as it was known throughout Wittenberg in Germany. Uh, instead, he wanted to cut off the things that were against the pure and clear teaching of the Holy Scriptures and the gospel. Uh, other men like and uh, uh, Andreas Karlstadt or Ulrich Zwingli tried a, uh, a, gr a more ambitious program of reformation that included iconoclasm, the smashing of statues, uh, uh, the whitewashing of the insides of the church, a complete jettisoning, uh, getting rid of the liturgy as we know it, and coming up with something that's more simple, pure, plain spoken, etc. cetera. Uh, Luther wasn't interested in that as much as he was interested in, in, uh, in preaching and teaching the truth and keeping whatever was good and helpful that preceded uh, the Reformation in place especially with regard to the divine service and, and uh, the prayers and the worship of the church. So let's talk about Ulrich, Ulrich Zwingli, 1484 to 1581, uh, a Swiss reformer influenced, heavily influenced by the ideals of humanism, even when it came to the dignity of man and the capacity of reason. Uh, he adopted a more pronounced ex acceptance, therefore, of reason's authority with regard to the scripture, and his proper interpretation, such that he could not be brought to believe that Jesus' words, this is my body, is actually what Jesus meant, literally. Um, he, uh, uh, he died uh, defending the walls of Zurich in 1531, so for him the Reformation was much more than just a spiritual activity of preaching and teaching. It was uh, uh, a political and uh, activity that he was illing, even willing to pick up arms and to fight for himself. Andreas Karlstadt was a Theologian also at Wittenberg alongside Luther, and during Luther's time at the Wartburg, uh, he famously uh, began a program of iconoclasm in, in Wittenberg, and not only that, he also uh, started to come up with pure uh, liturgies that were 
totally stripped bare and different from what had come before it. It became offensive to many of the people there, understandably so, right? Uh, he also rejected baptism and the Lord's Supper as sacraments. Uh, and because the true religion for a man like Andreas Karlstadt was the inner, was the inner man spiritually ascending to God, uh, he didn't understand uh, Luther and the other Lutherans preaching that, that God comes to us through the means of grace, such as baptism, the proclamation of the word, and the Lord's Supper. Uh, John Calvin, this is, he's more of a second-generation reformer, uh, and he was influenced by Martin Busser in Strasbourg, uh, Martin uh, Busser was a mediating figure between Zwingli and Luther, who tried to bring them both together and tried to articulate uh, a, a kind of theology that embraced both uh, that of the Radical Reformation and the Reformation. Uh, what makes John Calvin special is his uh, incredible intellect. Uh, his institutes are, are necessary reading for any serious theologian or student of Christian theology, and his programmatic reforms in Geneva, which, which were much more than just spiritual reforms. There were reforms that also, there were reforms that also encompassed all of practical life as well. Uh, instead of saying that uh, Christ, uh, that, that uh, the Lord's Supper is purely symbolic, it's pure it's symbolic of Jesus, body and blood at his presence, he said, no, Jesus is truly spiritually present in the supper and our souls ascend to be where Jesus is spiritually through communion. So instead of the, 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 the real presence as understood by Lutherans, that Jesus' body and blood are truly present according to the promise, uh, he would say, no, uh, there's only a spiritual presence of Christ. Uh, and so he also let his reason guide him in his doctrine of predestination. It was a kind of logical conclusion that uh, if there are only some who are saved by God's eternal election, then it's also necessarily true that others are eternally damned or reprobate. And so that's the, his particular Calvinistic doctrine of double predestination. Uh, the Lutherans, by the way, when it comes to the question of predestination, we are not double predestinationists. Uh, we do say that God predestines uh, 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 for salvation, uh, but the cause of, uh, uh, of damnation is found within man himself. Uh, we don't try to answer the question of why there are some who are saved and not others. Instead, as Lutherans, we say this is something that God has not spoken about. Uh, he has mysteriously covered it. So here we fear God and worship him and instead rely upon the word that he has given us, which is repent, believe the gospel, and you will be saved. That's enough for us. Also, the Anabaptists, this is a, a group of people who rejected the outward forms of spirituality like baptism. Uh, what's necessary is a spiritual washing and not a water washing, right? Uh, Thomas Munzer was one of these guys, and he was guided by secret revelations and visions, so not so much a sola scriptura kind of guy. Uh, he was a leader of the Peasants' Revolt, we mentioned uh, again in, in 1525. He, uh, uh, he rejected participation also in political office or civil affairs, and he tried to establish an eschatological kingdom uh, of people who were fleeing from the world and living in the world. And of course, this kingdom, because it was acting in rebellion against the established authorities, uh, was besieged and destroyed. Now, a few words about the Counter-Reformation. Rome, of course, is not just watching this and saying, huh, this is interesting, let's see what happens. No, Rome fights for its, its power over the minds of people, especially uh, papal supremacy over the churches. And so for that reason, uh, it strikes back with uh, re-emphasizing medieval piety uh, and combining it together with a new form of mysticism. Uh, you have to remember that humanism as a movement remained by and large loyal to Rome, even if it criticized Rome. Uh, it revived scholasticism as it was practiced by even new religious orders such as uh, our friends, the Jesuits. And it also engaged in military campaign, of course, uh, uh, through Charles V, uh, against the Protestants in France and Germany. The Council of Trent is basically the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church that we know of today. 
it dogmatized many of the medieval teachings that had been disputed up to this point in history, teachings such as the existence and, and the necessity of the doctrine of purgatory, the nature of justification, original sin, and indulgences, uh, and it landed on the the, the, the Pope's, the Roman side of these questions over and against the Reformation and anathematized the Lutheran positions, if, uh, forever expelling them from their particular communion from that time forth being known as the Roman Catholic Church. It also, uh, uh, the Council of Trent uh, sought to reform various aspects of the church bureaucracy and clergy life, uh, uh, tried to push forward moral reform. Everybody could see that was necessary, and so they were not against that. Just, just the Lutherans and the theology of Scripture alone, uh, grace alone, and faith alone. Finally, let's mention the Jesuits. This was founded by a soldier turned mystic, Ignatius of Loyola, and uh, he strove to lead the masses who had been deceived by Protestantism back to Rome. And he emphasized rigorous education, and spiritual exercises uh, to overcome temptation and sin in one's life. In short time, uh, the Jesuits, who were highly uh, educated and, uh, uh, and rigorously trained, found the uh, key places at universities all over Europe and in royal courts, and this helped to stem the tide, of the rising tide of the Reformation. Uh, these Jesuits were considered uh, the special shock troops of the Counter-Reformation and fought vigorously against the Lutherans and Lutheran theology. All right, that's all I have for today, folks. Uh, maybe you've found some things that you are interested in and can Google. Uh, I gave you some book recommendations, uh, everything from Calvin's Institutes to Luther's On the Bondage of the Will. Uh, for Ignatius of Loyola, you have the spiritual exercises. You can look that up, too, if you're just interested in what those are. And compare and contrast, of course, what does it mean <laughs> to be converted, uh, to become spiritual, and to be saved? Uh, uh, you have sort of this emphasis on man striving towards godliness in, in Ignatius of Loyola. And with Luther and the Reformation, you have the emphasis rather not on what man does in, in combating and fighting against sin and overcoming it in his life, but rather that through God's law, uh, uh, man is crushed in the knowledge of his sin. And then through God's promises and preaching of the gospel that Jesus has died for us and that salvation is out of our hands and in God's hands, man's souls are lifted up to worship God, not necessarily in a covenant of law, but according to grace and faith alone. All right, God's peace be with you all. And until next time, take care.